We turn now to a discussion on the subject of Sondheim and American popular culture. The participants in the panel discussion will be introduced by its moderator, whom we're very pleased to have with us, a great friend of Stephen Sondheim, of the American Theater, and of Symphony Space. Please welcome Frank Rich. Yes. Good afternoon or evening, wherever we are. I'm, it's, wonder, it's, a wonderful, uh, it's wonderful to be here. It's a great event. Um, I gather that this panel is sort of uh, playing the role of a, sort of a clean act in the midst, midst of a burlesque show to sort of chase people out. Uh, we'll try to do a little better than that. Um, let me introduce you to our panel. Uh, Melissa Bernardo is an editor at Entertainment Weekly and, among other things, is in charge of their theater coverage. Andrew Lippa is one of the uh, one of the most talented, uh, as you know, young songwriters uh, in the theater today, uh, keeping along, uh, keeping uh, Steve's tradition going in the theater. Uh, his most recent show is A Little Princess, but I'm sure some of you remember his contributions to the last production of uh, You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown, as well as his version of The Wild Party. Joss Whedon is one of uh, is really one of the most original and brilliant writers that television has seen in the past decade or so. Um, best known for Buffy uh, the Vampire Slayer, but has worked on everything from uh, early on Roseanne to Toy Story to we read in this morning's paper uh, the, a forthcoming movie uh, version of Wonder Woman. And finally, Mr. Pop Culture himself. <laughs> I, can't, I can't resist saying, when's the last time you heard a critic get a hand like Frank got? <laughs> Fearful. <laughs> A reformed critic. I know. <laughs> that, may, that may be the reason for it. <laughs> um, the point of this panel is to break out of the theater for a little bit. No one here who's listening or who knows Steve's work needs to be told that his influence on American theater in general and musical theater in particular is, is colossal. But what about away from the theater, the, the hermetically sealed uh, world of the theater? That's that's what we want to talk about uh, uh, for a few minutes today. I thought I'd start with Joss, if, if, if you don't mind. Um, okay. You're a self-confessed self Sondheim freak. Um, one of the most brilliant episodes. <laughs> <laughs> I read this. Not in a stalker way. I, 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 when I met him, I would have said a much warmer hello. <laughs> <laughs> One of the most uh, uh, celebrated and brilliant episodes in Buffy is uh, uh, an episode where the characters sort of spontaneously start breaking into song and it's immediately assumed uh, it's, uh, that there must be witches or the devil or demons at work. It's so out of uh, tune with American pop culture. Talk about that a bit. And um, I did write uh, a musical episode of Buffy, um, and uh, basically uh, because I had a forum which TV gives you, um, because you do things, you actually said something about not wanting to write uh, the score until you had the thing cast and you had rehearsed. Well, I've rehearsed with these guys for six years, and um, I knew all of their limitations, and... <laughs> I probably should have said all of their talents. Um, and I knew I had time, about six months, to just try something very different um, and really create uh, a televised musical, which I hadn't seen um, since I could remember. Uh, there's a lot of musical episodes of television, and to me, they're variety shows. They're like a lot of the modern, I'm making quote marks, musicals, which, you know, just take some oldies, take some oldies, take some oldies. Um, and uh, I can pretty much say that's most of what I took 
from you uh, because I can't say, oh, I wrote just like Sondheim, because that's like saying, I write like Shakespeare because he's real good. <laughs> um, you don't, uh, you can't make that comparison. The only real presence, I mean, obviously there are stylistic influences. Uh, the only real presence I felt probably was every time I hit a really cheap rhyme or an almost rhyme or gave up the meaning for rhyme, there you were <laughs> at my shoulder going, okay, if that's what you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the very first, we should point out that uh, Joss, you know, wrote the music and lyrics as well as, uh, as always the, the script. Um, but what, what about the, did you ever think of going into musicals? I mean, there's a line I, I, I wrote down from that episode, uh, retro pastiche is never going to be a breakout pop hit. Is, <laughs> is, is that Hollywood's attitude? Or, there must be other Sondheim fanatics in your business. What's, what's well, I mean, if you're going to talk about Hollywood in terms of movies, Hollywood's attitude is what just sold. Chicago sold, so right now musicals um, have a better shot than they used to. Um, maybe not original ones, um, but certainly some of the classics. Um, in TV, I think it's different. TV, uh, there's very much um, an influence. I was raised by, my father wrote off-off-Broadway musicals, lyrics, and so did my grandfather, and then both of them went into television, and my father lived out here when you could write for television in New York, um, and he and all of his friends and all of that whole sort of theater, TV community that there used to be came to L.A. And um, there is this pocket, and it's particularly in television, of people who are absolutely fanatical. We know each other by the secret handshake. <laughs> and um, it, uh, I think the influence is not just the fact that we're all fans, um, and we find each other in, in strange places, but the fact that TV allows itself to explore and deconstruct and really examine things the way your shows do, the way your lyrics do, and uh, movies don't really have that opportunity. So writers who are really interested in the heart of things, I think the most important thing I ever learned about writing was that everything I wrote had to be about something. Every song of yours that I know by heart, which is almost all of them, um, <laughs> but I, again, not a stalker, um, uh, is about something. It's about the reason why it's being sung. And that's a really interesting mm. to deconstruct without breaking apart, not in a Dadaist way, but in a real sort of examining the meaning of everything you do sort of way. It, you don't get that opportunity in movies the way you do in TV. Mm. So there's a community there that comes, sort of came out from here um, that really is extremely tight and a little strange. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, someone who observes all of uh, pop culture, tell us some places where you see Steve's influence or his work regurgitated or... Okay. Actually, I'd like to take this opportunity to connect Steve to Jennifer Lopez. It's <laughs> <laughs> about time. Yeah. That's why I read really, that 10 weeks. Six degrees of Jennifer Lopez. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if anyone saw her recent fashion show. It was the most recent fashion week, her sweet face line. But the backdrop um, was this big neon sign with block letters and a staircase, and it was called J Lo Story. <laughs> and and she she did that on purpose. There was a there was a whole like making of, and she said, "Yes, I love West Side Story. I want that. I want that to be it because, you know, I'm a Puerto Rican girl from the Bronx." And and <laughs> so, I don't know if you you know got any money out of that or anything, but um, <laughs> there was actually another Jennifer Lopez connection I discovered recently um, a friend of mine told me about the movie Jersey Girl mm -hmm. and I don't know how many of you guys All saw three it three of you who saw it yeah. <laughs> there's a support and the rest group. of you don't see it Yeah. <laughs> see it and fast forward to the part the, the little girl like wants to go see cats but it's closed so, so her dad Ben Affleck takes her to see Sweeney Todd <laughs> yeah um, Except they're dressed like cats. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the first, like, throat he sees slit, he's like... <laughs> but it makes quite an impression on her, actually. And they wind up having a little salon in their living room and performing a number. And in a pageant in her class, this little first grader chooses to perform a number from Sweeney Todd. Every other first grader and their parents are performing memory. <laughs> 
And, and the woman comes out and says, and now little, what's her name, I forget, is going to perform what I can only presume is a hymn called God That's Good. <laughs> And, and they have this massive production number, and, and this little girl has the, has the Mrs. Lovett hair, and, uh, and Ben Affleck plays Sweeney Todd, and, and George Carlin is the first to get butchered, and he slides down, and Liv Tyler plays Toby. It, it's, it was really... <laughs> I take it back. Everybody goes see it. <laughs> it's better when she tells it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Stop. No, really. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, I just sort of like discovering it in unexpected places, or, you know, like an episode of Will and Grace, where suddenly the score of company is like blaring through their roof, and they have a moment where they start singing along, and, you know, it's, it's those places like that that I think it's sort of the most fun. It's like a little in joke for I'm me. Sorry. But I actually, uh, I went to school with um, one of the creators of Will and Grace, yeah. and he told me about stories about learning to sing from Jack Cassidy because he was also an Eastern. They were all over here too, mm -hmm. so it's more of that that wave, the TV yeah. wave. What do we make of the fact that Mark Cherry names episodes of Desperate Housewives after? Your songs. Have you seen the show, Steve? Uh, no, I haven't, but Desperate is in the title, so <laughs> connection seems, seems fairly <laughs> condign. Uh, um, Andrew, what about Steve's um, role in music beyond people such as, beyond the musical theater? Can, I know you might go to the piano and tell us a couple of things, but talk about it a little bit and maybe uh, a little uh, show and Sure, play. I want to go back to Jersey Girl, if that's okay. Fine. <laughs> Like, no, I'm kidding. So sorry. Uh, thanks. <laughs> sorry, Steve. Oh no, 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 no. No, um, no. I think you know. I think one of the things talking about popular culture uh, is that, in a way, uh, the name Sondheim has become like Kleenex or Band Aid or Dickensian, and and I think that's an unbelievable. I mean, the accomplishment of everything that Steve has written is, is on display here today, but then to sort of go beyond that and to become an adjective, um, you know, and someone describe your work as Sondheimian or Sondheimish or Sondheim-like, or <laughs> to see Steve's influence throughout music and throughout uh, popular culture, throughout these things that we've talked about, that's something that you, you don't ever plan for, I don't think. Um, did you plan for that? No, I, I don't think so. <laughs> Um, and it's something that 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 truly, be, you know, that's unbelievable. And um, I was talking with Frank backstage about one of the things about uh, Steve's music is that in a lot of songs, there's a very it's very thought out. He's very specific. There's a real specific uh, grounding to the accompaniment, a real specific grounding to the sense of this is how it goes. And yet. It's not just umchak 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 umchak. Although there are songs that are like that too for a certain effect. But a lot of the time the accompaniments are very, very composed. And yet there's something about that's so powerful about music that it goes beyond that. A lot of jazz performers uh, responded to it. I don't know if you've had a rap song yet or, or like, you know, like not If I, I Were a Rich Man, you know, which no, is now no. Rich Girl. Wasn't right? there a Sweeney Todd disco? Uh... Yes, there was indeed. <laughs> All right, there you go. Like but, I said, but, but not rap. But no, 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 no. But that, you produced the disco. You, you no, no, it was, it was Tom Shepard's idea. It was one of his whims, and as a matter of fact, it was kind of entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> to not sell a lot of records, but That's I right. liked it. That, or like Leah Delaria, you've heard her do the Ballad of Sweetie Todd. It's like a sort of Mac the Knife kind of mm -hmm. template thing. I don't know. Yes, I don't, I did have. you like that? Yep. Treatment. Yeah. I, I, I like it when people uh, when people take liberties, as long as they take plenty of liberties. Right. And say it's a different thing. If they just take a note here and a note there, it drives me crazy. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, come on. Don't you feel it yourself when well, you're somebody uh, singing a song absolutely. and change one some, note? I wish someone to... would do something I wrote. It'd be great. <laughs> Leia Delaria will. <laughs> um. <laughs> Steve, you, you could have had this whole career uh, writing Topper. Um, <laughs> but one thing I think a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of people don't know about you, if, it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the art form that you're most passionate about is movies. Mm -hmm. And 
What, what's your relationship to movies? You wrote, you co-wrote. I believe movie. everything they tell me, or did, <laughs> up until 25. I believed everything. I, I'm afraid that a lot of it hangs over now too. I just brought up on movies the way uh, a whole uh, two other generations brought up on television. It was. W I, were you ever tempted to do more in movies? Than you've no, done? I mean, I, I early on learned what the uh, what the role of the, forgive me the role of the writer in movies is, and oh, I no, knew it was not okay. for me. I mean, I, I mean, you know, you're just not your own boss. So, you know, unless you have to direct your own movie, unless you're Alfred Hitchcock and can write, which he couldn't. But, um, uh, you know, but there are writer-directors, as we all know, Billy Wilder. And people. Um, so uh, I would love to have written movies, except that I knew, that even when uh, Tony Perkins and I wrote The Last of Sheila, and we were good friends with Herbie Ross, st still, uh, it wasn't exactly what we intended, and he treated us very well. Uh, and, but still, you know, a, director, a movie director... It's his, it's his picture, it's not the writer's picture. That's all. What, what? I was never tempted to write musicals, if that's what you because know, musicals were not my favorite form of movie. Have you been, uh, well, this is probably a question you want to answer, but have you been happy with uh, the film versions of uh, any of your shows? No. <laughs> no. They don't, uh, it's very hard to make a movie out of a musical play, I think, and I haven't, I don't think I've ever seen one that I think worked, not just of my own. There's something about the repertorial quality of a camera uh, that is antithetical to what happens on a stage in a musical, which is when the audience's imagination goes. And even when they're efficient, as they're parts of West Side Story that I think are efficient, but it doesn't have the same kind of, um, it doesn't let the audience go. It's, you know, they're real streets, but there's call a coordinated wash. I don't know where I am, you know. Right. Uh, and um, I don't know. Can you talk? You were very excited about uh, the script of a, an adaptation of one of your shows that obviously hasn't been made yet. Can you talk about? You that? mean about Sweeney Todd? Yeah. Yeah. That I, I, John Logan, who wrote the screenplay, I think has found a way of making it so it's its own animal without destroying the animal. Um, I, may, I may regret these words, <laughs> and you may very well be asking me once again in a couple of years saying, well, what did you think? But nevertheless, it seems very good to me, and it's partly because Sam Mendes, who's, who's going to direct it, knows and loves both medium, and he understands the difference between the two. And um, he understands that you don't just make a movie by changing it so much that it's cinematic, a word I don't much like, and uh, at the same time he knows the difference between the stage and the film. So I have, I have great hopes for it. But Logan understands that too. Logan is, is like Joss, he's a, he's a, a musical theatre fan. He's a, he, uh, for those of you who don't know, he most recently wrote The Aviator, mm -hmm. the Scorsese yeah. film. When cuts are made and parts of the score are thrown out, does that make you insane? No, or? because uh, he, he approached it very carefully, and then I made some suggestions for some restorations and some suggestions for further cuts. Because, you know, uh, I can put my movie hat on. If I, I mean, I, lo I used to, when I was in my early 20s, I had a 60 millimeter camera, and I made little five- and ten-minute movies and spent all my time in the editing room because I, 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 love, I love the process of putting a movie together, the whole puzzle aspect. I think if I'd ever been in movies, I would have been an editor, is what I would have preferred to be, I think. Hmm. Um, it's sort of comparable to you. Once, uh, you once told me when I was interviewing you, you would have been a mathematician if you had not yeah. Yeah. Been, a, been a songwriter. Yeah. What about the whole is issue of the musical? And I'd like anyone to chime in. The whole, the whole separation of the musical theater from, from the rest of... Bob culture. What was interesting, bringing up Will and Grace, I don't think that has as much to do with me as it has to do with the fact that musical theater is now uh, associated because it's, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a major part of a tiny industry. And it represents a certain kind of, uh, what shall I say, character attitude. When it shows up in TV shows, it says, these people like musical theater, as opposed to pop music, as opposed to rap, whatever. And it's supposed to tell you something about the characters, quite often in, a, in I think, a denigrating way. But the point is that, <laughs> that, it's, it, that it, it's supposed to help define the characters. Because now it's such a specialized taste. This would not have been true in 1935. But now it's a specialized taste because it's such a specialized field. It really is, you know, it's really... Did it... Did it I know we've... We, you... You're the generation just before rock and roll came in, but it did, did it feel weird as your career began, you know, with West Side and so on, that you were going in this direction and suddenly the whole hit parade was going... No, it never, I don't think it ever occurred to anybody in my generation, certainly not 
that when rock came in, that it was going to be anything but that's popular music on the radio, and we're going to continue down our uh, shaky path and explore new things for musicals. And if anything, I thought you know they would get uh, more free form, and but they would be they would not be related that way. So it was a real split. So it quite surprised me when rock musicals started to come in, and then started to become popular, and then started to try to tell stories. Now, am I correct to say that in, in company, you used at least oh, a, a little certain soft, bit of rock? Oh, a little soft rock, but, that's, you know, but, but, but it wasn't a rock attitude. Rock isn't just about the music, it's about attitude. And it's about what's important, which is the performer rather than the music. Often, you know, in certain kinds of lyrics, the, the, the lyrics are, you know, important to the listener. But most of the time, it has to do with dancing. It has to, it's visceral, and it has to do with the performers. It, for me, rock is like opera. People who go to opera do not go, really, for, uh, uh, for, for Puccini or for Donizetti. They go to see who is singing. And it's a, it seems to me it's about the, the singer, not the song. I've always been about the song, not the singer. That's the way I was brought up. And uh, I, those are generalizations, but I think none of us saw that the split was going to, be, was going to affect the theater. It was just... It, you know, the rock was going to replace Russ Colombo, and we were going to go on you know, <laughs> in another. Also, in a lot of ways, I think, uh, uh, to continue on this subject, I think that uh, pure rock and roll, rock and roll like 50s rock and roll, doesn't lend itself to a theatrical storytelling medium. You know, there tends to be a lot of repetition. The chorus is four lines long, and it's repeated over and over again, and then it's over. It's two and a half minutes, and that's it. Um, and I think, you know, there have been some rock musicals that have found a way to sort of take... Uh, and again, we put rock, put rock in quotes because it's not really necessarily only rock and roll. It's rock or pop or R&B or what other, other, other uh, sort of composite that someone might come up with and found a way to sort of meld it with a theatrical way of telling a story and, and a theatrical way of writing a lyric so that things can be uh, character-driven and can be story-driven and can sort of come out of the situation. I think that's why there are probably more examples, again, I don't have my statistic book with me, but I think there are more examples of R&B-spiced musicals uh, uh, musicals that owe themselves to, more to the black tradition than, than musicals that owe themselves to the rock and roll tradition. And I think because that, the history of that music also comes from storytelling and character and experience as opposed to the history of uh, the rock tradition, which is m a lot more about single statement and repetition. And I think that that doesn't usually serve you in a theatrical storytelling way. Also, rhythm and blues has a tradition in the Broadway theater. I mean, there is a lot of rhythm and blues in Harold Arlen and certain kind, you know. And so there was that blending. Rhythm and blues isn't as far away from the traditional kind of, a certain kind of musical comedy, I think. Joss, when you did your, you're, you're being mo a little bit modest about the, the musical episode you did because it really is, Sondheim-like or Sondheim-esque, and you know, in in terms of, <laughs> you know, the way the way the the way the lyrics work, the, the way the, the sort of attitude and so on. I'm, and I'm curious, what was the response to it? Did people say, you know, hey, what is that thing you're doing, and would you do more of it? Or well, I, the response was wonderful, but um, I had, uh, I mean, I I definitely. It had a poppy feel to it, but as you said, pop is about repetition, and you know. Musical theater is about extrapolation. It's about taking it further, and and that was the thing that I knew I wasn't going to be on the radio with this thing. I knew that it, even though I wrote sort of kind of a pastiche that involved a sort of pop number, which uh, was the love song from Tara, um, I had you know everything set, and that's why the other girl complains that hers was a you know a pastiche that's never going to be a breakaway pop hit because it was kind of retro on purpose. I suited each song to everybody, but. Um, I had an inn, which was basically the idea that the characters themselves woke up one morning, started singing, and went, what am I doing? I'm singing. And because everybody in the audience always says, nobody will believe that people can really sing and dance suddenly in a movie. <laughs> but of course they will if they want to. If it's done right, if it's handled correctly, which it hasn't been for many years, of course they'll believe it. But uh, to take the characters and say, well, we don't believe it either and we hope it doesn't happen again, um, made it much easier for the audience to step over and accept it as a musical. It's harder, though, to use songs in a, in a storytelling form in movies, cause, um, which, and I, I include TV in it, because a single close-up can tell you all you need to know, that you don't have to sing, you know, good, bad, or indifferent, 
uh, the movie of a little night music, I begged Hal not to sing, uh, to have them sing the entire You Must Meet My Wife, because a simple statement from him and one look of dismay on her face tells you all you need to know, and the joke is over. On stage, you can take three minutes and sing it out, and in opera, you can take 15 minutes and sing it out, <laughs> and they do. Uh, but, the, but the whole idea of time, of movie time, of, of screen time, whether it's TV or movie, and stage time, two entirely different things. That's one of the things that makes it so hard to translate uh, a stage play into a musical. Steve, when you look at uh, pop culture, including particularly pop music, but all of pop culture, do you, do you, what, what, if anything, of it now speaks to you, and, and where, if anywhere, do you see stuff that's on your wavelength uh, in some way? Well, musically, not a lot. Every now and then somebody will uh, uh, introduce me to, to something or somebody that, that sounds interesting, but I don't listen to a lot. Uh, I listen to a little in the car radio. And that's... I'm going to make you a mixtape. <laughs> You're, you will not be the first. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm always open. I listen, you know, and I, I listen. You know, sometimes you have to get into an artist, and by artist I mean singer, rhythm. So you have to hear two or three songs before you get it. I mean, I know that you're very taken with Eminem, but I, I suspect it, you had to listen for a bit before you got into it. Or am I misquoting? I'm no, still no, listening. No, not at all. <laughs> no, um, no, and there, there are people who don't. I mean, don't, I understand. I, I just um, think he's cute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's a word I've never uh, heard really associated with him, but it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, what about, you know... <laughs> I don't think he'd like it. <laughs> I don't think it's not about like him. him. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's always about him. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Steve... <laughs> um, the Alan Rene film uh, that you did, Stavisky, you know, um, it seemed to me there that um, there was something about that storytelling that showed a certain kind of synergy with, with some of the experiments you've done in storytelling in, in, uh, in your shows, whether going backwards in time or fractionalizing time or repeating things with variations. Well, it's also a, a, the express, expressivity of a character through music without, you know, and there were no lyrics, and lyrics are what hold things up on the screen. You know, it's explaining something and it's explaining it with music, so it goes up, you know. But uh, there was, uh, one, one of the reasons Rene liked the score was it expressed something about the character. But first-rate film composers have always done it. Bernard Herrmann, always is writing about character. All the music is expressive of that. You know, you, you, you can take certain themes and harmonies from one Bernard Herrmann movie to another, but you can't take the whole score. He has, he's characterizing the score. You listen to Fahrenheit 451, he characterizes what's going on there. It's, uh, he's remarkable. And so that's what I, what I was doing with, with Stavisky. I thought, well, I don't know an awful lot about movie scoring, but I know something about expressing character in music, so that's that's it. Maybe that's what you're referring to. Can I ask what, uh, how uh, you got involved with Reds? Oh, w Warren Beatty came to me with this extraordinary... He said, I've been filming over a period of ten years witnesses to John Reed and the whole Russian Revolution episode and his part in it, and he had. He'd been, you know, filming Rebecca West and people who were there. Some of them were now dead, and he said, I finally... I think I have the backing now to make a movie about it. And um, so he came to me. He'd asked me to do a movie before that. He'd asked me to do Heaven Can Wait. And I told him the problem is, because uh, I'm not an orchestrator, I can't do chase music. I can't do it. What I can do is themes or something. And that's what he wanted for Heaven Can Wait. He wanted a so-called love theme, but I, I, I was busy doing something else and I couldn't do it. When he came for Reds, I said, I can't do the, 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 you know, the, the, the battle with the caissons. I can't do the train arriving in Baku. I, can't, I, you know, I can do the stuff between the leading characters, if you like. He said, fine. And then I realized what he wanted was a love theme. And that's what he got. Which was beautiful. Which we heard earlier. Since we're on movies, I'd actually just love to know what some of your favorites are, or movies that you can go back and watch again and again. Oh, movies? Favorite movies? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> oh, there's so many. I, uh, you know, I, li I, I, I like a lot of the obvious ones, like Citizen Kane. And, uh, most movies I find, much as I like them, don't hold up a second and third time, usually the first time. Uh, but I'm, I'm very fond, oh, so many, Powell and Pressburger movies, and... Um, George, Steve George Stevens. George Stevens, oh. 
Talk, talk a second about George Stevens, because, I, mean, I mean, you sort of turned me on to his movies. I'd never really, maybe because of the last part of his career, I'd never taken him that seriously. Yeah, well, he got, he got long-winded the way everybody got long-winded, uh, you know, in the, after the studio system broke up. There was nobody to say, keep it to an hour and a half, and all the movies became taffy pulls. And Stevens, I'm afraid... You know, even something, if he had directed Diary of Anne Frank in 1945, it would have been quite a different thing than when he directed it. It would just, you know, he'd stretch the... But I used to say about Stevens that except for, there's only one category. I think he directed the best of every genre, the best Western, Shane, the best adventure picture, Gunga Din, the best comedy, More the Merrier, the best romance, Place in the Sun. And it's, I'm exaggerating, obviously, but nobody did, did them better. But he never did film noir, which is, uh, I suppose, my favorite. He never got attracted to that, and um, I don't know why. But I, that, it's just, he could do, he, he, I love versatile directors, Michael Curtiz, George Stevens, people who could do any kind of movie beautifully. And William Wilder, I mean, you know, so I, I'm into the directors even more than the movies. But, oh, I've got a lot of, a lot of favorite. I've got a lot of obscure favorite movies, you want. Contract, Christoph Zanussi may be my favorite movie. Mine too. <laughs> subtle, Josh. Um, Very subtle. Yeah. Um, we're back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're about to wrap up before this sort of devolves into a Franklin Shepherd Inc. Um, uh, <laughs> Any any last thoughts or questions for Steve or I'm curious what the rap song's gonna be now. Personally I think Andrew's gonna go home and start working on it. Well, but but a Andrew Andrew has this marvelous generational one foot in each. He loves traditional musicals and he loves hit contemporary or I, at least I, as I assume some of the way you talk, some of your contemporaries and even younger writers than you. And it's the kind of thing that, that Jonathan Larson was trying to do in Rent, which is to marry the two, what you would call the pop culture then and the pop culture now. And that's a field that's wide open. Uh, I would try to accept that pop and rock are not part of my gut because I was brought up that one generation too soon. I can imitate it, but it's not the same as loving it. When I'm imitating... Harold Arlen or Irving Berlin or Jerome Kern, it comes out of love and it's part of my blood. But if I were imitating Eminem, I could imitate it, but it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be the same thing. It just it w wouldn't feel, and I, I know it from uh, composers who shall be nameless of my generation who've tried to put rock into their shows and uh, into their operas, and it's very unconvincing. Let me ask you one last question and then, and then uh, uh, that'll be it. But thinking about how for instance, in Follies, you you internalize those great songwriters and 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 reinvent them. Do you ever um, wonder what'll happen if that whole idiom mm. passes out of style? If people don't know who Harold Arlen is, or, or or have you had the experience of a show like that being done for audiences that you think have no clue? I I I I, 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 do, I do think that that maybe they will pass out of existence. I mean, who who today listens to Victor Herbert or Sigmund Romberg? I mean, you know, and that's just one. <laughs> <laughs> and and they're not even younger than ninety. Uh, uh, no, uh, but uh, you know, and they, when when uh, my generation came in, my father couldn't understand what we were doing because he was stuck back then. He, he, you know, he thought Richard Rodgers was a little, no he didn't, avant-garde, but I mean, you know, uh, uh, but uh, that was his generation. And then mine, you know, it, uh, I, I couldn't understand what he liked in, in that generation. And um, yeah, I think it could, but then we get onto larger subjects like is, you know, how long do you think the theater's going to last? So, you know, we, there are plenty, plenty of... Well, uh, uh, for, uh, that'll uh, be for the wall-to-wall -wall, uh, yes, right. uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, um <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, it's great talking about you. Thank you. Very much.